All right, well, it's, the, it's 12.30 now. I'll give everybody another minute or two. There is chat turned on for there, just so if you'd like to ask a question, you can all, always ask it in chat. I've uh, turned off, every, kept everybody on mute so that we can get a good recording of this for other folks who can't join, because there's a lot of people who are time zone challenged in the Commons group. So I'd like to get started. My name is Diane Mueller. I'm the community manager for OpenShift, and I'm really pleased to have this many members of the OpenShift Commons groups um, joining in with us today. Um, and there's a number of you, already 20 individuals here, so I'm, I'm really pleased at that. Um, this is the first in our series. We're going to do about one a week for the next little while on different topics around um, OpenShift and V3, Ops, um, OpenShift on OpenStack. And this first one, um, we have the great pleasure of having Mike Barrett, who's the product manager for OpenShift from Red Hat. And he's going to give us a, an update and um, on OpenShift V3, the new stuff, and um, sort of set the ground um, for what OpenShift Commons is. And so I'm going to let you get started there, Mike, and um, we'll save time at the end for Q&A. And as I said, please um, use the chat room for, for questions, and we'll get started then. All right. Thanks, all. Great. All right. Thanks, Diane. So Dan mentioned my name is Mike Barrett. I'm a product manager on the OpenShift team. I specialize in the on-premise distribution or the private cloud distribution. And so I get to go out to a lot of our customers and talk to them about how they're using the product, how they're integrating with their data center infrastructure, how they're working with developers, applications, and all that fun stuff. Uh, so thank you for having me. Um, we're really happy and pleased with uh, the comments, right? It's a very sp specific implementation of a community gathering. So let's get into what that is. No barriers to entry, right? Um, you don't have to buy into this group. Uh, what we tried to do was bring in an assortment of different people from different backgrounds, our actual customers, our ISV partners, our VAR resellers, our code contributors up in origin. You're all invited to this gathering, and you all have an equal voice. And what we're trying to do is just structure around what that voice can be. We'll, we'll suggest topics to get things started. Uh, we'll hope that you guys will start interjecting with each other, uh, explaining how things are going. So that's really the premise of the comments, to really bring our larger community together. It's a meeting place, right? It's a dynamic website, and it's more than anything else an information repository. It's another place to get more information about what we're doing with the product, what people are doing with the product, more importantly. So we have a lot of customers at this point in the community. This is a way for you guys to start talking to each other from a peer point of view, to share your interests and goals. I can't tell you how many times I've been in customer meetings where I wish another customer was there. and. Many of our customers want that opportunity to reach out to each other without us in the middle. So it really is the next step for the product. Once you have this many customers, it's just a natural progression, and uh, we're ready to take that further with you. You don't have to be a code contributor to be part of this community, right? We can better the documentation. I can get feedback from user stories. We can talk about the UI design. Uh, we can talk about the coloring. We can talk about pull requests. We can talk about just about anything you want to talk about, how you've implemented the product at your own data center, uh, how you've uh, mitigated DNS, uh, DNS or DMZs or did global routing or found a solution for shared storage or integrated it with a continuous integration tool set or got into a larger Git deployment. These are all things you can start sharing with each other and with uh, the community. Participation, lots of different places to get involved. Foremost, it's an email alias, right? So OpenShift-Commons has been active now. Um, if you haven't sent an email out there to OpenShift-Commons, please do. You know, introduce yourself to the other members that have uh, signed in and said that they wanted to be part of this community. Um, it's a nice icebreaker. Just give a little bit about yourself and why you joined. Um, other than that, we are on all the classic multi or social media conduits, right? Uh, the more important ones for this community, I think, are going to be the Trello boards. If you have not looked at the OpenShift Trello boards yet, totally do. Um, 
there's a lot of information there about where we're headed and a lot of information where you can contribute back to that open source project. All of our developers are on IRC, so that's another great area to uh, grab onto. Uh, Diane runs our Google Plus community. I think we're over a thousand members at this point, so that's another one to join. Uh, Facebook is and has attractive for, I would say, this community. Uh, blogs are definitely. If you, and in fact, if you ever write a blog on the product, just ping us or the community, and we'll point some social media in your direction. Um, the SIGs or the uh, interest groups are going to be important. We have two interest groups right now. We have platform as a administrator, uh, somebody who owns the PaaS, keeps it up and healthy, deals with a lot of the day-to-day -day operations. A lot of those topics are very specific, so we have an interest group on that side. And then the next one is where we're going with the version 3 product, which I'm here to talk to you about today, and nuts and bolts and designs and all that fun stuff. These briefings, which this is an example of, are going to be on BlueJeans. So that's where you're going to be able to hit us up, just like you did today, and find out more information about the coming topics. So let's talk about the next generation. Um, this is a product that is under active development right now. It's OpenShift version 3. Uh, we're asking our developers to maintain two code chains right now. Uh, they work on the 2.x and the 3.x. Uh, we don't want to stop cold turkey on 2.x. We're still putting features into that, and we'll continue to do so. Uh, that end-of-life support date is well into 2016, so we understand it's going to take a while for our larger customers to migrate over to 3.x. When we look at 3.x, um, it's got a lot of great components that I'm going to get deep into. But first, you know, why make the move? And it starts around innovation acceleration. You know, we really live in a world where applications have a shorter life cycle with the market capitalization. We look at, you know, the World Series apps that hit your iPhone and Android, you know, a lot of people made a lot of money off of them, and how many of them are making money off of them right now? So it's a it's a smaller window to get in and get out. It's also a more innovative, uh, more cycles during innovation, right? We're not just doing paper processes and doing simple CRM relationships with our customers. We're doing larger analytics. We're doing hit and misses, and we're really mapping the next generation application. So we need a platform that's going to allow us to really innovate, spend a lot of cycles, but not, not be forced to eat that cost, not be forced to stand up that infrastructure. And we find that platform as a service really balances these, uh, these two approaches. And how do they balance it? Well, we're, we're using containers. We're moving to microservices and APIs for those services, and we're moving to a DevOps relationship. So where are we innovating? What is new about this platform? So right off the bat, it's based on RHEL 7. Uh, we're moving away from RHEL 6 and onto the RHEL 7 with this platform. RHEL 7 has got a lot of namespaces that we require to pull this off. Uh, we also have Atomic has a new distribution of RHEL 7 that I'll talk about on the next slide. If you're stuck on RHEL 6, we can totally run RHEL 6 workloads. We just run them on top of a RHEL 7 host. We just run them in the, uh, in the guest container, so no problem there. Container model changes drastically. We move over to a Docker model from our gear model. Uh, this allows us to pick up more namespaces like the PID and the network. It allows us to do some more real IP work and other features. Orchestration changes, right? We move from our Ruby broker with a active MQ message bus and a Mongo storage over to a Kubernetes backend, and I'll talk a lot more about that. The packaging model changes. We're no longer adding personality or content into the gears with cartridges. We kind of merge the cartridge with the gear, and we come together under a Docker image. Uh, platform routing. Uh, right now, in the 2.x, we pretty much give every application its, its own routing. We set up an HA proxy in front of it. You integrate that with your larger data center fabric. We're moving to a larger central uh, fabric, and I'll talk about that. So Atomic, right? How many PaaS providers also have an operating system? And right down the hall from me, we have the rail kernel engineers working night and day on this Atomic distribution. It's just enough OS. It's moving from 4,000 RPMs down to 400 RPMs. It's purpose in life is to run Docker containers. So it uses a um, RPM OS tree update mechanism to give you a more 
confined environment and adding software to it and rolling back off of different uh, file system partitions. Uh, it allows automatic usage of system D to init and watchdog the containers that you may run on top of it. It automatically brings in SE Linux policies for us. So a lot of the stuff that we were doing in OpenShift, we now push down to a dedicated operating system that's built solely to run containers. And this really breaks down the operation uh, costs that we were facing in the previous uh, product. Current generation, you guys seen this slide a lot, right? It talks about our gears, our SE Linux policies. We sit on top of nodes, use our broker. That changes, right? That this is what we're here to talk about today, these nuts and bolts. So on the broker layer, that becomes a Kubernetes master. And on that Kubernetes master, we have some services that are important to us. We still will support the Apache mod and all that authentication that you'll find there. We're adding to that OAuth. We've had a lot of requests over the last couple of months to add OAuth to our authentication. So that's going to be there for you. ETD is our uh, persistent storage layer that keeps track of the services across the cluster. Um, it's found in a lot of solutions like this, so it's got a really good track record for the job we're asking it to perform. I'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later. The replication controller. Uh, this is another nice thing about Kubernetes. In order to get onto the platform, you have to have a health definition. And if you fail that health definition, well, I'm just going to just replicate you somewhere else across that Kubernetes cluster. I'm going to bring you up. So no longer does it matter. You have different recovery processes if you've lost a node, if you've lost a container, if you've lost a routing mechanism. doesn't matter. We're just going to replicate you in another part of that cluster. The scheduler is really the placement policy, right? This is how we find the least loaded node. This is how we identify which nodes have the right content, how we identify which ones are in the right availability zones or the regions. What's nice about Kubernetes, though, is that this is very pluggable, and there's other vendors in the market that are interested in contributing to it. So we have Hortonworks talking about plugging in Yarn. We have Mesosphere talking about plugging in Mesos. So that really allows a platform to grow organically in that ecosystem. Moving out of the broker over to the nodes, these are also called minions in Kubernetes speak, uh, we have a couple of nice things to talk about here. We have pods. Pods, uh, it's an interesting name, pod, because it makes you think that there's a lot of things inside the pod, uh, but it's not the case. So a pod will typically wrap around a single Docker container. You will have pods that have more than one Docker container in it when you want low latency or you traditionally would run things on the same box like a Postgres and it's admin daemon or something like that. But for the most part in the applications that we end up deploying and talking about, you'll have one Docker container in a pod. For an application, you'll have multiple pods spanning multiple nodes. You can run more than one pod on a node. What's really clever about the pod design though is that it holds the definition for the shared storage and the network for that Docker container. This allows a little more mobility for that Docker container as it tries to find another host across the node should something happen. But that abstraction layer really opens the door to a lot more use cases for us. On top of the pod, on every single node out there, there's this service layer. And the service layer is what talks to etcd. It's what knows the relationship between pods to form applications. It's what knows what all the nodes are doing. In this way, every node what knows what every other node is doing. So it's very easy for us to replicate and to move things around if everybody knows what everybody's doing. And the brain trust of that relationship is that etcd. We have one routing layer, right? You don't see a HA proxy standing up in front of every application anymore. You'll have one. It'll be the for the platform. It'll be customizable, it'll be HA'd, you'll be able to integrate it with uh, your own data center fabric. But uh, we've had a lot of requests to move to a central routing layer. The developer experience changes, right? We want to keep the developer experience that we have today. The developer shouldn't have to know anything about Docker, just like he did, didn't have to know anything about Gears. He can come in at a code point of view, from his IDE, from his Git, commits, whatever the case may be that stays the same. We stand behind that 100%.
what we needed to do is add something to it, right? We now have these developers that want to bring Docker images from their laptop or from Docker Hub or from other locations into the platform. So we had to do something to allow that, to allow that pull from the local repos, that checking, that managing, that bringing up pods and all that fun stuff based on a Docker image that you're bringing into the platform. So I'll talk a little bit more about how that happens. Applications are still deployed. REST APIs are still there. So that's pretty much the holistic picture of where we're moving with the platform. What we think this represents is how was we, you know, it, our first move was the Docker. When we looked at our, you know, this is going back probably two years. When we were in RHEL 6. We're working with the RHEL kernel engineers. They're coming out with their own next generation container putting a lot of those namespaces and a lot of those attributes into RHEL 7, and Docker's coming up at the same time. And what was attracting to us was the larger community that was being born around Docker. Uh, you know, we have the kernel engineers that are capable of writing container, uh, container technologies. What it didn't have was that ecosystem, that outside of us ecosystem that we wanted to take advantage of. We saw the same exact thing happening at the orchestration level shortly after we made the decision to move to Docker. And by doing it at both levels, by commoditizing the technologies at both levels, we pick up exponentially larger communities than ourselves. And this has been just an enormous win for the platform. Because what we have always been interested in was the developer user experience, was the services, the deployment patterns, the things that we offer, the integration with Git and Jenkins, and really this superior nature of that rail operating system and allowing us to consolidate a lot more workloads onto it. That's what we've been about. And this is the next generation pass stack we firmly believe, and this is where the industry is going to move. What an ecosystem it is. I talked about that choice to move to it before. Uh, a lot of vendors from the competitive point of view, from friends and alliances, from different industries all together. Uh, so they seem to all be coming together around one solution. What is better, right? What is better in this architecture that I just showed you? You know, OpenShift has been a bit unique in the PaaS market in that it allows for non-HTTP traffic. We just released our XPaaS, our Fuse cartridges, about two months ago. They allow non-HTTP traffic to be born and routed to and from the platform, typically in a PaaS market, you use HTTPS on the platform and you call outbound to services that you need and you bring them back in. And the difficulty was routing back in. Routing outbound was quite easy. Getting back to the same gear or the same container was difficult for them. We're using an SNI trick to achieve it in this current platform, the 2.x platform. Uh, but in the 3.0 platform, that goes away. A lot of that um, heroics that we were doing at the at node level with the Apache routing, with the vhosts, and then with the loopback file system or loopback interfaces, you know, 127.0.0, that all goes away as we achieve the network namespace. So we don't have to start with the HTTP. We can start with the database. We can start with non-HTTP traffic, and we can build from there. So it's a different beginning point for applications. The other thing that Docker brings to us is this immutable concept. Operations can start from that gold image, and then anything that changes, such as code pushes or new features, we can cause a triggering or a layering to occur, and then we can use that layer instead of changing that gold image. So we have that immutable standard. You can further decouple dev from ops, right? We can go with known deployment patterns. We can learn from our 2.x with those hundreds and hundreds of quick starts and cartridges that we have out there and how the over 2 million apps deployed on OpenShip.com are many enterprise customers. We know how to stand up a lot of these applications. That deployment pattern just wasn't there in, say, the Kubernetes or Docker, and we're bringing that to it. You know, better abstractions of the network, storage, and health. Network has been uh, probably the number one integration point that we spend the most time with with our customers. And so this gets a lot cleaner as we move to a Kubernetes cluster with the pod model. The shared storage in the 2.x version were locked on block storage and API-based storage like S3 or ESB. We pick up the ability to do more file-based storage. 
which is very helpful because a lot of customers are using that because it's typically cheaper. And health, right? We talked about that replication controller before and being able to replicate without doing very specific things for very specific failures. It moved to a true cluster, right? This thing looks more like an HPC type cluster that we saw in the early 2000s and where we're able to move things across farms, across larger segments of boxes. You're allowed to declare how you want your application to look, what qualities you want from it, and the cluster will make sure that's maintained and make sure that that's out there. Where you want to be um, introspective, if you will, you do that the scheduler layer. So what does OpenShift bring on top of all this, right? It gets confusing when you start commoditizing your components. You know, what, what features were just in Docker, which features were just in Kubernetes, which features are just in OpenShift. And what OpenShift's focus is on is that do Docker linking, right? You know, being able to do that overlay network across your multiple nodes and being able to cluster out the EAP instances, uh, adding nodes to Tomcat, scaling your databases, adding sharded MongoDB instances. You know, this is what the world that we live in. This is where we want to be, and we're able to bring that uh, to that Docker linking projects. Around the user experience, right, we're more interested in the developer projects. We're more interested in seeing a project be born with team members, with team members being at different roles, with seeing usage of resources or IP and other uh, things. That's what we want to track from the developer point of view of a code project. And it doesn't necessarily need to be a developer. It could be a service admin or an operations admin that owns that project and delegates out. The next one is the big one, right? This is, uh, you know, if you looked at our existing user model in 2.x, our workflow, it's very uh, source code based and binary deployment based. It's adding content to applications, adding new features to applications. And to do that, we needed to bring that over in an open source project called uh, Source to Image that I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, but that allows us to, uh, to give a developer a Git workspace or an IDE workspace, have them commit back and have just magic happen, right? Have Docker layers be born on the right atomic node, on the right shared storage, on the right pods, and bringing those up with the right routing. So that's a, a lot of heavy lifting that we're doing for that developer. Deployment patterns we already talked about. Moving things across the life cycle is important as well, right? We want to be able to promote code from different environments. We want continuous integration solutions such as Jenkins to be able to target different projects that represent different life cycles for that application. And that's something we want to come out of that box with. So source to image, this is a really cool open source project out there. If you just Google OpenShift uh, source to image or STI, we sometimes abbreviate it to. Um, this brings up the main use case that we have, right? From a developer point of view, knowing absolutely nothing about Docker, absolutely nothing about Kubernetes, to be able to just commit back off of a Git to either work in his IDE, see his project, and have that rolling, right? Have that rolling of the Docker layers, identify a Docker layer, push it back to that Kubernetes pod, bring that pod relationship with the Docker linking the overlay networks to the other parts of it, form that route, maybe it's a DNS route, maybe it's non-routable DNS, all those things are just automatically happening for us. It also gives us a cleaner, more scientifically pure rollback mechanism. I know that I'm going to roll back to a very specific layer of Docker, a very specific image, and that's helpful for operations. So the other side of this is the, the platform, Kubernetes, uh, underneath us, needed to be it needed some more intelligence to it around our use cases and that's what we're bringing to it a more intelligent platform based on the things that we care about and what do we care about we care about changes in source code right when somebody commits a line of code we want to recompile relayer and push when jenkins wakes up off of a failed or a working uh, smoke test we want that to work when a vendor provides a new binary in his docker hub to update his application. We want that to wake us up and do the redeployment. So we're doing a lot of automation around a lot of the things that people who use PaaS care about. They care about their binaries, their applications, their source code, and their continuous integration code the path to production. That's where we want to live and that's what we want to provide. So 
at the end of the day, we want a very repeatable and a very fault tolerant across that farm and a very automated process as you move your applications around. Where we're focused on spending our R&D is around this triangle, this layer. It's really around the spanning of infrastructures, right? No longer are we seeing people that are running in private and public, and we've seen that for a couple years now. We see people who want to actually span both private and public with a business service, and that's bringing new and exciting opportunities to the forefront. Containers, you know, we've always been about containers and we always will be about those containers. We find the atomic project to be extremely exciting in the fact that we have so many uh, kernel engineers working on that and making our platform pushing a lot of that intelligence we had in 2.x into that host. We get to just capitalize on that in a more fluent way, which definitely lowers that operational cost. Microservices, right, breaking up teams, breaking up monolithic applications, forming independence of features, right? I can take, I can risk mitigate as I move into continuous integration delivery if only one part of the larger application fails. And that allows me to really uh, push the needle and get to that market a lot faster. DevOps, right, is basically finding tools that give me a way to define the relationship between two working groups um, to allow operations to guarantee the qualities that they want, right, that resiliency, that uptime, that efficiency, that utilization, and then have the devs hop on and be able to think they have full control over that. I have root. I have all these other abilities to see log files as if I'm on a real operating system, and it's a trapped environment. So DevOps is definitely fluent. It moves into larger value adds such as continuous integration and continuous delivery, and that's part of the triangle that OpenShift wants to be a part of. So as we look at our community, this is the community um, components that we're looking at bringing into the commons, right? The people who, we have a lot of uh, CCPs, what we call cloud providers uh, joining the commons. You'll see and you'll hear their voice and what they want out of it. You'll have companies that are into that Docker ecosystem that want to make sure that their images run on the platform, so you'll be able to hear from them. We have microservices. We have a, we're at the forefront with our Fuse portfolio and our new Feed Henry acquisition of moving to a lot of these architectures for applications. We're bringing a lot of people in their communities into the commons. And then on the DevOps, we've historically had a strong DevOps presence within the open source communities that follow RHEL and Fedora and CentOS, and we find them joining the comments. So you'll, you'll get to hear at each one of these layers a lot. So call to action. You know, I already mentioned totally hit that email alias, introduce yourself, but I want to give you some ideas and start chatting about, start kicking around some ideas uh, where we should go. But in order to do that, you guys have to get your feet wet. So definitely uh, hit these URLs and you'll find there's an alpha one drop of the version three product. In 30 seconds, you're pretty much gonna stand up with Kubernetes, Docker, and that source to image solution without knowing it, uh, knowing anything about it. Uh, that blog will actually walk you through the steps. You can just copy and paste these commands and you'll get a good feel of what it feels like to stand up a pod that has a Docker repo in it, to pull an image, to subscribe to a web hook out on a GitHub for a code change, to have that code change go ahead and relayer an image for you, to go ahead and have that image fail, and then have the replication controller bring it back online. So these you'll get to see all those components working already in the in the dev concept alpha one drop. The next drops are coming. We'll have one once a month. Uh, so December's will be coming up here. We'll add that project concepts and the multiple users. Uh, you'll get that RSC command line back. Uh, you'll see multi-node deployments right now in the Alpha 1. It's pretty much on one laptop that you'll be working with. But you'll be able to add in more minions. You'll get the platform router. You'll get a Docker uh, repo integration that's outside of the product. And then in January, we'll bring in that browser user interface. We'll talk about more of these Kubernetes components that we can integrate and leverage. And then we'll talk about the Docker layering control. So definitely start with Alpha 1, get a feel for it, get excited about Alpha 2 coming out and then Alpha 3. 
Then beta will add more features. The beta is pretty much what we think in our minds to be a true replacement for the 2.x product and which features it's penetrated into. And we see that starting towards uh, February. And then the shipping product is targeting right now, you know, things change every day, but right now we're targeting uh, for the middle of, the, of next year around that June timeframe. So things that we can talk about. Um, DNS has been a big point of conversation with all of our on-premise solutions, not so much the public ones because we take care of that for you. Uh, but integrating with DNS, and we're thinking about adding this ability to have non-DNS routes if you wanted them, um, you know, just basic IP-based routing. Uh, so we want to hear if you think that's a good idea. Another one is um, environmental variables, right? In PaaS, we use environmental variables quite a bit, and it really allows that magic of auto-binding cartridges together, you know, without developer needing to know how to add Postgres to his EAP. We can pretty much take care of that for you through environmental variables. Uh, what we're thinking, though, is making them a little more secure and allowing people to have secrets, and this will be using maybe a, more like a traditional hypervisor key store. If you're familiar with Zen, you know, it has this ability to have something in the main host, some information, and have that call through a TCP socket, encrypt it up to the guest. And this is a way to have more defined secrets across platforms that our um, cartridges, or in this case our Docker images, can start using. So that's another one to start talking about. Um, evacuations has come up. You know, right now you can totally move gears around in the 2.x platform, but it's a couple commands, right? It's identifying what the gears are, it's stopping them, it's then moving them and bringing them online somewhere else. We've had some people say that we want a one-click evacuation process. So we're interested in hearing what do you want to evacuate? Do you want to evacuate entire availability zones, or is it really just one node to another node? What types of evacuations are you interested in? The idler, right? This is a huge feature uh, for us. Not a lot of PaaS providers offer it, uh, but pretty much in the 2.x platform, what we end up doing is holding the URL to your application up with that HA proxy, shutting down that gear if it hasn't been HTTP requested in over X amount of time. And then when a request comes in, they're going to hit that URL that we've been holding, and then while we're holding it, we'll bring up the gear. This allows a huge density, right? This allows us to run with active max gears of around 75, where traditionally you would think that was crazy. Um, what improvements do you want in the idler? Are you using the idler? Have you seen problems with the idler? Where do you want us to move? Another big one is continuous integration and delivery, and that really revolves around Jenkins right now. There's pretty much three use cases around our Jenkins interaction. One is, you know, I have an existing Jenkins and I want to just use post actions after you know, tests have passed to push out these artifacts to OpenShift, to the platform. Another one is the one that we support out of the box, and this is us standing up a Jenkins, right? An individual developer can choose at any time that he wants to add Jenkins to his application. He doesn't have to know anything about Jenkins. We just give him that cartridge, he adds it, and then when he builds, it builds off on the Jenkins and it'll push that to his environment when it's done, the binary. Have you had problems with that? Do you want to see more um, extensibility in what we're offering out of the box in that area? And then the third one is, if we were to have an external Jenkins, would you want it to use OpenShift as build slaves and then push? That makes it a little bit different than the first one. So those are the three areas that we're kicking around around the Jenkins use cases. If you favor one over the other, let us know. Let the community know. Let's have a discussion about it. Okay. So that's an ex yep. There's a couple so of questions come, coming in if you're oh, ready sure. for those. So yeah, let's get the questions. They're in the chat, but Joseph is asking, um, what would be the recommended OS? RHEL 7, Fedora 20, 21 for development? Right. I have um, my personal opinions, but you can go for it from product management. Right. So, I mean, we love RHEL 7. Um, that's what we're going to make sure it works on. But uh, the Fedora 21 is a, is a good candidate. I, I think, uh, Diane, do you know what we 
put out on origin or uh, openshift.org? I think we're using uh, CentOS 6.5, um, so and that's what I've been testing with, and CentOS 7. Great. Any of them what should work the, nicely. Uh, so the other question was... Right. Any thought on Go as an alternative to Jenkins or Go CD? Um, yeah, so in terms of shipping out of the box, uh, we we're still favoring Jenkins, but we found over the last um, couple business quarters is that there's a huge um, market in continuous integration delivery. There's probably over 20 companies at this point uh, making quite a bit of money, so they're quite large organizations. Um, we want to make sure that we're open to all of them, that we work with all of them. And it really comes down to that API at the end, the post-action APIs. So we just want to make sure that our REST APIs are callable in a fluent manner with whatever anybody else is doing. But for the most part, I think right now we're going to stay with Jenkins for the out-of-box solution that we provide. Again. I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, I'm going to say that if you have questions, you can always um, ping someone on the IRC channel on um, OpenShift or OpenShift-Dev, and we highly encourage you to, to post it to the OpenShift-Commons mailing list, which you should all be members of. And if any of you are not, um, just give me a shout, and I will add you in. Um, I think we've got most of you on there. And please do introduce yourselves there. I won't wait and see if there's any other questions that come in. And I can see Romaine in the dark there. Um, but I'd also encourage you to um, visit the, um, the, the landing page for um, OpenShift Commons um, and click on the SIGs. And if you're interested in joining either the Ops or the V3 SIG um, to get on those mailing lists as well. And uh, we can further send out some more information to you about that um, if you get questions. Let's see what chat holds here. All right, there's another question here. Um, for enterprise, what's the timeline for Java middleware? Do you have one there? Great. Yeah, so the um, Java middleware, well, the goal of the release is to make sure we have the exact same content that we're providing in the 2.x and the 3.x, if, if not that, then more. Um, so when we look at the Java middleware stuff that we were providing today, I, we totally foresee that being in Docker images around the time that we release. Uh, more importantly, the app server, the Tomcat derivatives, um, and then moving into uh, third parties, right? When you look at Docker, as more and more companies adopt it, you'll find more and more officially supported solutions instead of things just provided by the community. So we think June is a good time frame to start seeing a lot of that content. Right. And I'm not seeing any more questions at the moment. Has anyone else got anything else? All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And a special thank you to Mike Barrett for doing this session, because I know he did another one earlier this morning. Um, and so he should be ready for a nice large glass of water, hopefully. Um, and we'll be doing another one. Next week, I think we're doing OpenShift on OpenStack, and we'll send out the, the, the invites um, and the information for signing into the Blue Jeans to the mailing list as well. So please do pay attention to the mailing list, and um, we hope to have you all back here and help you um, get through to V3 and help you give us feedback, make pull requests, and start um, taking part in the, the Commons conversations. Thank you all, and thanks again, Mike. Great, thanks. Bye.